ISO.org is the premier online Bible school developed by Perry Stone. ISO.org has dozens of courses, hundreds of lessons, and thousands of students all over the world. Sign up today. Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Today on the program, I'm going to teach a message that, in my opinion, is one of the three most significant messages the Lord has ever given me in 44 years of full-time ministry. I call it when God disrupts your plans. Now, some of you who are partners have already heard me teach this in churches in the year 2019. But I felt like this was the place to teach this because right below me is the Sea of Galilee. And so in John chapter 21, I want to begin reading there and get started because there's a lot to cover here. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and that's the Sea of Galilee. On the wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and that word Didymus means a twin. He had a twin brother. Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee. These are two men, James and John, and the two other of his disciples. Now remember this, there were 12 disciples. Judas had committed suicide. There's 11 that, that remain. And here in this incident of John 21, right here at the lake, there are seven out of the 11. That means there's four missing that are not here, but there are seven. Now, when I read what I'm about to read in the English language, it sounds like Peter is saying, I wanna go get in the boat and just catch some fish. That's not how it reads in the Greek. And I want to thank Kenneth, Kenneth Wiest for pointing this out. And here's what it says here. Simon Peter said to them, that means he said to these seven disciples who were followers of Christ. And remember, uh, actually, if you read in Luke chapter 5, verse 10, uh, the sons of Zebedee, James and, John's, James and John, were partners with Peter in a fishing business. And I'll point that out in a minute. Peter said to them, I go a fishing. Now, it sounds really strange. You know, in English, you would say, I'm going fishing. But here, the way it's translated, doesn't that sound weird? I go a fishing. That sounds like a southerner. I go fishing, you know? All right, here we go. Then they, and these are the other six, said, we also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship and immediately, uh, immediately, and that night they caught nothing. So what I want to point out, first of all, is... What Peter is saying here, I go a fishing. Now, it's pointed out that in when you read this in English, it sounds like he's going to do a one-time fishing trip. He's hungry. He wants to catch some fish. In the Greek, I go, for I go a fishing, is the Greek word hopago. And it means, now catch this. Here's what it means. To sink out of sight or one who departs from being another's companion. So, here's what the Greek scholar says. Peter is saying... Ready? I have decided to go back into the fishing business. And they said, we're going to go with you. I'm going to ask you a question. Why would Peter want to go back in the fishing business? And why would the others, and many of them, by the way, just so you'll know, about seven of the 12 original disciples were from the area of Bethsaida, which is one of the three main cities around the Sea of Galilee. And it was a great fishing village back in the time of Christ. But here's the question. Why would Simon Peter want to go back into the fishing business? Because again, in the Greek, that's what the word means. It means to separate. So he's basically saying, I'm leaving the ministry. I'm separating from the ministry and I'm going to go back into fishing. Two things I want to point out. Point one is he had failed the Lord. He had denied him. And that had never been dealt with yet. Jesus would deal with that later on in the story. But Peter had denied him. And when Peter had denied the Lord, he did something very strange. And Mark points this out in Mark's gospel. Now, Mark was the first gospel written of the four. And uh, the other gospels, perhaps as scholars have taught, picked up Mark's stories and carried them over because they're identical. Mark says that Peter swore and cursed when they asked him, do you know this man, Yeshua or Jesus? And he cursed and denied that he knew him. In Mark's gospel, the Greek word there is anathema. And it's the word in Aramaic that actually means to put a self-curse on someone. Now, in that time, 
from the rabbinical source, if a person did something almost, we won't say blasphemous, but really sinned in a major way, they could be cursed, a curse would be placed on them and they would be expelled from the sanctuary. If it was serious and it was a real heavy sin against God, the rabbis had the power, now watch this, to bind or loose them. To, to bind something, uh, to, uh, to, to bind something was not to allow it. To loose something was to allow it or permit it. So it was the rabbis that had the authority to say, we permit you to remain because you've repented or we are removing you permanently. So here's the thing with Peter. And this is why he went out and wept bitterly. When he denied the Lord in Jerusalem near the time of the crucifixion, he actually placed a self curse on himself. And that's what that word means in the Aramaic. And it meant that he had said, if I know this man, may I be expelled from the kingdom of heaven and the, king, the, and the nation of Israel. This is, very, this is as serious as it gets. And then he realizes when he hears the rooster crow, I've denied him. So watch, Peter's never dealt with that. So he says, you know what? I'm leaving the ministry, going back to the fishing business. Here's number two. The reason Peter wants to go back in the fishing business is because Jesus has already told him, I am going to go away. And if I go away, I'm not going to leave you alone, but I'll send you another comforter. And Jesus said, where I go at this time, you can't go. So Peter knew. Now watch this. He had given his life and ministry three and a half years to this, Naz this tall suntan Nazarene who he believed was the Messiah. Now he knows that this Messiah has raised from the dead, but he's going to go back to heaven. Now, what are you going to do? You've given three and a half, you have left a fishing business. Luke 5 tells you Peter had a very successful fishing business and his companion fishermen, or we would say his co-business partners, were the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. So now you've got two things going on in Peter's life. Number one, he has put a self-curse on himself that goes all the way back to the time before the crucifixion that he's never dealt with. And the second thing he realizes is that the one he's followed for three and a half years is about to leave. So what do you do? You're going to go back in the fishing business. Now, here's the point that I want to bring out. They fish all night because you've heard me teach this from this location, that on the Sea of Galilee, they, the fishermen and the fishing boats fish at night. Now, everybody look out there. You're, you're looking at this. There are no boats. You know why? They all fished last night. And the only boats out there are tour boats taking tourists on rides. Because on the Sea of Galilee, you feel how warm it is right now? See, you all can't feel this because you you're sitting at home watching it on TV. We're here, okay? But is it real warm? Yes. So what do fish do when it gets hot? Why do you have to catch certain fish in the morning? Help me, fishermen. Because they go deep. And this is what they do here. So they, they had fit now. They fished all night and caught nothing. Why is it significant to understand that they caught nothing? Because if Peter would have caught this great catch of fish at this moment, he would have been tempted to say, I can be successful at doing what I did in the past. Here's my point. That was not God's will for Peter. God's will for Peter was to be the apostle on the day of Pentecost to help get the church organized and to be the apostle to the Jewish branch of the Christian church. Peter did not know the future. He did not know all the plans God had for him. So he is going to make his own plans. But ladies and gentlemen, when God has a purpose and a plan for your life, and it's really a supernatural plan that you may not know everything about it and you may not understand the details, please understand that sometimes God will allow your plans to fall flat on their face and not work out because it's not where he wants you to go. Now, so Peter has caught nothing. Now, watch what happens here, because this is where it gets a little bit interesting. The, he has said, I go a fishing, which the Greek word means, as I said earlier, to sink out of sight, or it means one who departs from a companion. And his, the other disciples say, we go with thee also. Now, I've, I checked out this, and the scholars say this, that in the Greek, it means we are joining you as partners. In other words, it's a tense that says continual fishing, not a one-time fishing trip. We go with thee in the tense as to we're going to go ahead and join the business with you. Now, think about this. Here are seven disciples out of 11 that are about to start a business, and if they do and it's successful, what's going to happen to the church? 
You tracking with me? Yeah. Yeah. What's going to happen to the church if their, if their will is done instead of God's will? So watch what happens. When the morning was now coming, I'm in, uh, I'm in John 21, 4. Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus said, children, have you any meat? They said, no. He said, cast the net on the right side of the ship and you'll find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fish. Now that disciple whom Jesus loved, and it's John who wrote this, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now here's a question. How did they know that this was the Lord? And number two, why did they not recognize it was Jesus? And the answer as to why they did not recognize it was Jesus is verse eight. And the other disciples came in a little ship for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits dragging the net of fish. Now 200 cubits is a football field. In other words, go and, and um, for you who are not Alabama fans, bear with me with my story. <laughs> bear with me with my story. But we were blessed to, uh, 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 the Tonga Valoa family, we know them, and we were blessed to go to a football game. And we got to go out on the field where the game just was. And I knew this story, so I stood at the goal line of one end, and I looked at the goal line at the other end because I knew the story. So I wanted to see, could I recognize anybody at the other end of the goal line? And it's very hard. So I believe that they, Jesus was... Uh, literally a football field in size away and they didn't see it was him. But watch, even though they didn't see it was him and for some reason they didn't recognize his voice, they recognized the miracle. Now let me show you why I'm talking about recognizing the miracle. When you go back to John, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, to Luke's gospel, here's, you will discover that Peter knew who Jesus was because uh, in chapter 4, uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus came out of the synagogue into Simon's house and Simon's wife's mother-in-law was taken with the fever and he, they, they besought him for her. He stood over her, rebuked the fever and it left her and immediately rose and they, they ministered to him. Now, Jesus goes into Simon Peter's house and Simon doesn't get converted. Hello? He's an old crusty fisherman. Now watch. He's not impressed that his mother-in-law's fever has been healed. Because that's a minor thing. It's just a fever. And, uh, and to be honest, he may not have liked his mother-in-law. <laughs> he, might, he might have been saying, what'd you do this for? <laughs> but, but, now, but now watch what happens after the mother-in-law is healed. Then he, Jesus is here in the Galilee and they have, they have two ships and one is Peter's ship and one is James and John's ship. Now remember, they're in business together, okay? And you can read the chapter and find that out. And they're washing their nets. They have fished all night. Jesus enters the ship, thrust out from the land and sat there and taught the people out of the ship. And the reason is, did you get up this morning and hear the voices coming from those boats? Water carries the sound. So Jesus pulled out and he preached toward the lake and it bounces off and you can, you, everybody on the shore could hear. It's an amazing thing. And that's what's happening here. So when he left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out in the deep and let your, let your nets, nets for a drop. Simon answered and said to him, master, and that's a respectful term, sir, we've told all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, and that's the Greek word rhema, at thy quickening word, I'll let down the net. And when he had done it, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and their nets break. And they beckoned to their partners who came and filled up two ships and the ships were about to sink. Then watch, Simon Peter saw it and fell down and said, depart from me, I am a sinful man for he was astonished. And he's astonished because he knows you can't catch fish after the sun comes up. And when he sees two boats loads of fish, he knows this man absolutely has some kind of authority and power. And watch what happens. In verse 5, he calls Jesus master, which is a respectful term. But when, the, when he sees the miracle, he calls him Lord. He didn't say, oh, master. He said, oh, Lord. Something will change when you encounter him. Amen. He won't just be a prophet or a good teacher. He'll be the Lord when you encounter him the way you should. Now, here's what happens. This is the miracle of the catching of many fish that convinced Peter that Jesus was the Messiah. So we turn back over here and realize, watch, Jesus has now repeated the same miracle. He toiled all night with these seven six other disciples. He caught nothing. They're now realizing there's no fish to catch. Jesus then shows up and when they bring that catch of fish in right here in John 21, John screams out and says, Peter, it's the Lord. Well, how did he know? Because nobody is supposed to catch that many fish. And come on, somebody. Yeah. When the sun comes up. And they knew, they knew that the last time that miracle was performed is when Jesus himself performed it 
and Peter was converted. Now what's funny, and I don't want to get into this because it's a little humorous, but Peter, uh, he was not properly dressed and he jumps off the side of the boat into the lake. Okay, you can read about that later, okay? <laughs> now here's where the story gets really cool. Je Jesus called Simon, Simon, all right, 69 times. He's called Peter 158 times. He has called uh, Simon Peter 18 times. But now, after the incident of the boats being filled with fish and they sit down to eat, Jesus calls him something three times that is not found anywhere else in the Bible. Does anybody know what it is? It's not Simon. It's not Peter. It's not Simon Peter. He says to him, son of Jonas. Simon Peter, son of Jonas. That's in verse 15. He said to him si a second time, Simon, son of Jonas. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas. Now, Jonas here is Jonah. It's the name for Jonah. It literally is. So he's saying, he didn't say, Simon, let me ask you. Do you love me more than these? Simon, let me ask you. Do you love? He, he calls him three times only here. Son of Jonas. Do you know why? Track with me. Because there was a man named Jonah in the Old Testament who had to do the will of God, but decided to go his own way and ended up in a boat. Yeah. <laughs> ended up in the wrong boat and ended up at the bottom of the sea. And God had to get his attention. And I believe, and this is just something my interpretation, I believe he's saying to him, now, Peter, you are, your father's name was Jonah. So Bart, that, means, that means you're Simon, the son of Jonah. Is, that's his daddy's name. So it's, he's not being disrespectful by calling him that. But he uses this to edge him a little bit. Hey, Simon, basically he's saying this. Hey, Simon, your daddy's name was Jonah. Are you going to act like the Jonah in the Bible? Do you love me enough to do what I say? Or are you going to go back and get in the boat and get out of my will? <laughs> Got it? You got it? Now, what is also interesting here in this story is that he then asked Peter three times, do you love me more than these? Now, we all know this if you've ever heard this taught, especially from my ministry. I've been teaching this for years. That Jesus know, knew that Simon Peter had denied him three times. One time he said, I don't know you. Second time he said, I don't know you. Third time he said, I don't know you. And this is when he denied the Lord in Jerusalem. Now, track with me here. Mark's gospel, as I said er earlier, uses a Greek word where it's, it, he's cursed and swore. It doesn't mean he was necessarily using profanity. The Greek word there is an Aramaic word of which alludes to putting a self-curse on you. The only way rabbinically in that day that if you were under that particular curse that the Aramaic word uses there in, from the Aramaic, if you were under that, the only way to get free from it, are you ready? Is for a head rabbi to come back and you repent to the head rabbi who then approaches God on your behalf and you can be forgiven, watch, and restored back into the synagogue. Yeah. Who's the head rabbi here and who's the priest? Christ is the high priest, right? He's the new rabbi. He's the new high priest. So three times Peter denied him and three times he covered it up and said, okay, you love me? That covered the first denial. You love me? That covered the second denial. You love me? Yes. That covered the third denial. And on the third denial, what would have been perceived, and I think these men would have understood this, is that now the high priest who's Christ and the head rabbi who is Christ, has now released this man from his self-curse. He released him. So, Jesus, Jesus set Peter free from a curse that he put upon himself. Then, I want to I I talk about this real quick. Three times he said, feed, first of all, Jesus said, if you love me, feed my lambs. That's in verse 15. If you love me, feed my sheep, verse 16. And if you love me, feed my sheep, verse 17. So he tells him about feeding sheep three times. Now here's what he's saying. I told you you would be fishers of men. Now you're trying to go back and catch fish. So let's switch this up, Peter. You're not just going to be a fisherman. You're about to be a shepherd because a shepherd takes care of sheep and lambs. 
And it's real interesting because there are two different Greek words that are used here. In verse 15 and 17, that word feed means to graze and feed a flock. Verse 16, the Greek word changes and it, it, it actually means to govern or to guide. So he's saying to him, Peter, here's what's going to happen to you. If you will follow me, you're going to feed spiritually through my word, the sheep and the, the lambs. The lambs are the younger believers. The sheep are the older believers. But you will also have to govern them. So he's predicting that Peter would be a leader. And we do know from the Apostle Paul in Galatians that Paul was the leader of the Gentile branch of the church, the apostle to the Gentiles, and Peter was the apostle to the Jewish branch of the church. Now, here's what's important that I want you to understand. If God had not let this man fail in the business... He would, have turned, he would have turned back into it and missed God for his life. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but there's some of you that have tried to run from God, maybe from the call of God. Maybe you used to go to a church, you used to be involved, and now you're not going at all. And so things have not worked out for you well. Could it be possible that the Lord is saying to you, the reason it's not working out well is you're stepped out of my will. You're not doing what I originally told you to do. Whoever I'm talking to now, please remember this. Sometimes God allows your plans to fall apart. Years ago, I was going to move to another state besides Tennessee. And some things began to happen that caused the whole plan to fall apart. And here's the reason why. It was not where God would have me to go. The Lord had a plan from the foundation of the world for me and my wife to move to Tennessee the town of Cleveland. Cleveland, Tennessee had a prophecy on it that was given by an angel of the Lord to a man of God in 1959, which was the same year I was born. And I didn't know this till a few years ago, that Cleveland, Tennessee would be in the end time, a hub of one of the great end time revivals. And some of the great ministries of God and even denominations and Christian universities are located in Cleveland, Tennessee, which they now call the Bible buckle of the Bible belt on the East Coast of the United States. We have 300... Think about this. We have 100,000 people in our 100,000 people in our county and 380 churches. It's one of the most Christianized church communities in the East Coast of the United States. So I'm saying this, the Lord had a plan, but I had to follow it. And sometimes bad things happen, not because God's trying to hurt you, but he's trying to move you into his will. Well, folks, there's a lot more to this and I've given you as, as much as I have the time to give, but we do have an offer for Manifest. Please watch this. And I'm always telling you now, stay tuned to the end and come join us in one of our regional meetings. God bless you from the Sea of Galilee and the Mount of Beatitudes right here in Israel. I want you to see and hear my most requested and my favorite teaching of all time, the Rapture Revelation. You can glean from 1,400 hours of detailed research on the subject of the rapture. This five DVD, that's 10 hours of teaching, unlocks this mystery. Digging deep into both testaments using Hebrew and Greek word studies, mysterious prophetic patterns, ancient Jewish customs, rabbinical insight, and early church writings to present a detailed explanation of the coming of the Lord for the church. The first DVD is titled, The Rapture, A Revelation Revealed to the Apostle Paul. You will discover how this was revealed to Paul on Mount Sinai in Arabia. You will learn eight different activities to occur at the rapture, and I will explain eight different Greek words used in the New Testament that detail Christ's return. The second DVD is the prophetic timing of the rapture. I will give you eight examples of the righteous escaping wrath and four clues pointing to a pre-tribulation return of Christ. Learn how in the book of Revelation, the 24 elders, the seven sealed book and other imagery reveals a pre-tribulation return. I will also answer numerous controversial questions about the timing of Christ's return. The third DVD covers the subject of the rapture, Israel's feast and harvest cycles. You will discover how Israel's seven festivals conceal amazing prophetic information about the rapture, the mystery of the shofar, how Israel's yearly harvest cycles encode the pattern of the catching away. Discover nine events that you will experience the moment Christ returns. Also, DVD number four is so exciting, The Rapture and the Mysterious Book of Remembrance. I will show you from Malachi 3, a key to going in the rapture is your name being in the Book of Remembrance. You will see how being an overcomer is different from a non-overcomer 
as it relates to the return of Christ for the church. You will see how the Feast of Trumpets is linked with the Book of Remembrance and how the rapture is designed as a special blessing to the believer. Now, not only that, but I've included a fifth DVD, the reenactment of the Jewish wedding with a hundred cast members using props and costumes, showing you not only the ancient Jewish wedding, but highlighting 14 keys of how the Jewish wedding points to a pre-tribulation return of Christ. These five DVDs in this beautiful album are for a donation of just $65 or more. Order by calling 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323. And ask for offer RA137. Or order online at perrystone.org. You may also order by mail by writing me at Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. Again, that offer request is RA137. You will learn a lot, so don't delay. Get your DVDs now. Well, once again, I want to thank you for watching the Manifest Telecast. I want you to share uh, God's Word with as many people as you can. We have a very good audience in the United States, but our largest audience is outside of the United States. Uh, there are countries where we have one of the top three programs aired on television, so we're grateful for that. And we also are hearing from so many new people who are watching our program. As a matter of fact, uh, my wife was informing me based on numbers that we have this year broke all of our uh, numbers for new partners joining the ministry. And we're not even at the end of the year, which is amazing. So thank you for that. And I believe part of that is that we keep a lot of you informed on the Bible and teaching and bringing you the Word of God. I'm 61 years of age now and have been in ministry 45 years and gone through uh, wonderful times in the Lord, the wonderful glory of God, the great revivals and conferences and conventions, have gone through many battles and have been very, very, very battle tested. If you see that little sword right over there on the on the um, on this side of well, this side of my shoulder, it is represented of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is the Word of God that has carried us through all the things that we've dealt with uh, this year and all the previous years of our life. And I'm grateful for the prayers and the friendship of so many people. Let me just mention to you uh, that the offer is very significant. And if you are a person that doubts the rapture, doesn't believe in it, or questions a lot about it, this will answer so many questions. So I do hope you, if you don't have the series, take the opportunity to obtain the series. Now, and you know, before long, we will be coming into, of course, a, another new year, which on the Gregorian calendar will be 2021. And uh, we have not yet set itineraries or anything of that nature for next year. We do know that there are some things that we're planning, but we're going to spend time in prayer to try to have the mind of God. For those of you that were coming to Montana or South Dakota to our meetings that had to get canceled because of the coronavirus, we will at some point, we don't know that we're going to use a convention center we may have to go into a church and maybe do it that way but we're going to do a what I call a western tour I've told my wife I want to I want to get a bus don't know how I'll, I'll do that and she's not for the bus she says I'll get sick driving it I said well you and James and Karen Wheaton and whoever wants can ride in the back in a in a SUV but I like to sit out there and be able to study and get up and get something to, uh, to drink and, and that kind of thing and get my water or my uh, uh, milkshake or whatever ha having but we may do a bus tour of a rural revival and also out west we don't know yet but you'll be informed about that but we are going to do out west we're going to come out there we knew God spoke to us to do that and that vision is still there and we're also wanting to be a part of the rural, rural revival we're going to try to have some conferences next year we don't know how many or where so perrystone.org is how to stay in touch with us and and check out the Perry Stone a YouTube channel. Subscribe to it so you can get all of our video updates every week. God bless you. Expand your understanding of Scripture. Advance your effectiveness in ministry. Earn certification for your knowledge of the Bible. International School of the Word. Developed by Perry Stone and Dr. Brian Cutshaw, ISO.org is the premier online Bible school with dozens of courses, hundreds of lessons, and thousands of students all over the world. Sign up for one of our exciting, affordable Bible courses and begin your journey at ISO.org today.